Hello, today we're going to talk about lung cancer screening with low-dose CT. I'm Caroline Childs, Professor of Radiology at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. I have no financial relationships with commercial organizations to disclose. Our learning objective today is by the end of the talk I'd like for you to be able to describe the, the patient eligibility requirements for low-dose screening CT. I'd like for you to be able to develop C pre, CT protocols for the screen that comply with the CMS requirements, and I'd like for you to be able to incorporate lung RADs into your screening reports. Now, why is screening for lung cancer so important? Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the world, responsible for more than 8 million deaths worldwide each year. Until now, most cases of lung cancer have been diagnosed when the patient develops symptoms and then presents to their physician for evaluation. And this typically corresponds with an advanced stage lung cancer, which has a, a very poor uh, five-year more survival rate. Screening offers the possibility of detecting lung cancer at an earlier stage when treatment can improve the outcome. Another uh, aspect of lung cancer screening is we have the ability to identify a high-risk population. Currently, 15% of adults in the United States are current smokers, and we have a very large population of former smokers who remain at high risk. If we look at the lung cancer mortality by stage, we know that if we combine all patients with lung cancer, only 18% will survive uh, five years after diagnosis. And the reason for the very poor five-year survival is exactly because patients often present with distant disease. You can see that the five-year survival is only 4.5%. They often present with regional nodal involvement, which uh, has a five-year survival of just under 29%. And only the minority are diagnosed when it's early localized disease. But you can see that if we can find lung cancer, at a localized, perhaps stage one uh, lung cancer, this has a much higher five-year survival. And that's why screening with CT offers such hope that we can change the statistics of lung cancer. Now, how did screening uh, with CT get started? In the 1990s, reports appeared from investigators both in Japan and from Cornell University in the United States stating that CT could identify small lung nodules that were early stage lung cancer. And I've listed three of the earliest references here, a two from Japan, and then, of course, uh, a landmark paper from Claudia Hinchke uh, uh, describing the Early Lung Cancer Action Project. So for those of you who are interested in the, the historical beginnings of, of screening with CT, I would refer you to these articles. Now, seeing that we could find an early lung cancer with CT, it offered the possibility for a stage shift. Now, the definition of stage shift is that we increase the number of lung cancers found in stage one, but there has to be a concomitant decrease in the number of lung cancers found in advanced stage, for example, stage four. And if we look at the table on your right, you can see that uh, it 2007 to 2013, you can see that the majority of patients, 57%, present with distant uh, involvement. So this is a stage four lung cancer with distant metastatic disease. We can see 22% uh, presenting with regional nodal involvement, and again, only 16% with localized uh, disease. So this is the current uh, st stage uh, distribution of lung cancer in the absence of screening. So what we were hoping with CT is that we could shift uh, lung cancer to be more patients, patients having stage one disease, fewer patients with distant stage four disease. But for CT screening to be accepted, it needed to be shown not only to just show more stage one lung cancers and fewer stage fours, we had to show that it reduced the number of deaths from lung cancer. And this is the definition of uh, a screening test being effective. So again, the current distribution of lung cancer by stage, you can see that the majority, 57%, with distant disease. For us to see a stage shift, we have to have not only an increase in localized disease, we have to have a concomitant decrease in distant disease for this to be 
uh, effective and not just over diagnosis of lung cancers that would never have been clinically significant. So the question is screening for lung cancer effective is really asking the question is there a mortality benefit? Screening for cancer must reduce the number of deaths from that cancer in order to be considered effective. So even though we had this early evidence showing that we could use CT to recognize stage 1 disease, we needed additional evidence to determine if it could find not only more early stage lung cancers, but reduce the number of advanced lung cancers, and most importantly, reduce the number of patients dying from lung cancer. And this evidence uh, was presented in the large National Lung Screening Trial. So this trial enrolled 53,454 participants. Uh, this was sponsored by the National Cancer Institute and took place at multiple inst institutions throughout the United States. The eligible participants were defined as high risk for lung cancer. They were high risk not only because of their age, their ages were 55 to 74, but they were either current or former smokers. They had to have a smoking history of at least 30 pack years, so that would be a pack a day for 30 years, or two packs a day for 15, for example. Uh, they could be former smokers if they had quit within the last 15 years. Patients were randomized to receive three annual screens with either a low-dose chest CT or a single PA view chest X-ray. The enrollment began in 2002. Uh, there were three annual screens and then follow-up ended in 2009. This is the study design. You can see that the over 53,000 smokers and former smokers in the trial, they were randomly uh, assigned to either the CT arm or the chest X-ray arm. They each received three annual screens and they were followed for an average of 6.5 years. In the background of the trial, there was a data uh, safety monitoring board that was looking at uh, the, can the lung cancers diagnosed and they were looking at the deaths from lung cancer. And you can see that if we start at time zero, where we started screening and then we screened again at year one and at year two, and you can see that the deaths began early in that, in that first year. And over time, you can see that the red curve, which is the number of deaths in the chest X-ray arm, exceeded the number of deaths in the low-dose CT arm. And at that point, the, the board said, well, you've, you've shown that there is a benefit, uh, and so they've stopped the trial at that point, which was in 2009. Now, defining the lung cancer-specific mortality is not just the number of deaths from lung cancer. It has to be calculated as a mortality per 100,000 person year. So I'm presenting that to you here. You can see on the top row with the low-dose CT arm, the 144,000 uh, person years, 354 lung cancer deaths, and you can calculate the mortality per 100,000 person years. And if you do this math, you can see that 245 is 80% of 308. So this is how we could calculate a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality in the CT arm relative to a chest X-ray arm. If you looked at the all-cause mortality, you can see that in the CT arm, there was a 6.9% reduction in all-cause mortality relative to the chest X-ray arm, which was largely due to the, um, the reduction in lung cancer deaths. There was not a significant reduction in any of the other uh, causes of mortality, such as heart disease or, or respiratory disease. There have been a number of papers uh, looking at the cost effectiveness of lung cancer screening. So the question of, is it effective? Does it reduce mortality? Yes, but is it cost effective? That's a separate question. And I would uh, refer you to these excellent articles by Bill Black, his original article in the New England Journal in 2014. And then there's a review article of his work in the Journal of Thoracic Imaging in 2015. And I would uh, recommend those articles to you highly. So following the conclusion of the National Lung Screening Trial, and there of course have been a number of other trials as well around the world, we needed to have a transition from this as a research tool into clinical practice. Initially after the results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, screening was offered, but it required patients to pay out of pocket. And to get reimbursement 
for a, from a third-party payer required approval from the United States Pre Preventive Services Task Force, which issued a Grade B recommendation in 2013, and then subsequently approval from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services it, that was issued in 2015. So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation required that uh, insurance companies offer this to eligible patients and then the CMS uh, approval meant that Medicare would cover it for its beneficiaries. Now you might want to look at this website at the bottom of the screen here. This was the CMS decision memo which came out in February 2015 and they defined eligibility criteria in three groups. First of all the beneficiary, the patient, the reading radiologist and the radiology imaging facility. So in order to get reimbursement from CMS for uh, screening a, a Medicare patient, you have to meet all of these eligibility criteria. So first, the patient has to be eligible. They have to be in the age range of 55 to 70 years. They have to be asymptomatic for lung cancer. They can have other symptoms, but not signs or symptoms of lung cancer. They have to have a tobacco smoking history of at least 30 pack years. They have to be either a current smoker or one who has quit smoking within the last 15 years. And then they have to receive a written order for low-dose CT lung cancer screening that meets specific criteria. So those are going to be on the next slide. So this patient must meet with either a physician, a PA, a nurse practitioner, or a clinical nurse specialist. And at that point, the healthcare provider will determine that they, the patient does meet the eligibility criteria. At that point, there's a shared decision-making process where the uh, healthcare provider discusses with the patient the potential risk to that patient for screening and the potential benefits. There should be counseling that if they start screening, they need to stay in the screening program and uh, continue to receive screening annually. They want to talk with the patient about their co personal comorbidities, their ability or willingness to undergo diagnosis and treatment. If we find something on the CT, will this patient be willing to undergo biopsy, surgery, or other treatment? Smoking cessation is a very important part of this visit, and at the end of this visit, the healthcare provider can provide a written order for lung cancer screening with low dose CT. The radiologist reading the scan must be ABR board certified or board eligible. They have to have documented training in diagnostic radiology and radiation safety. They must have been involved in the supervision and interpretation of at least 300 chest CTs in the past three years. And they have to maintain uh, CME credits in accordance with ACR standards. The imaging facility must perform low-dose CT with a volumetric CT dose index of less than or equal to 3 milligray. And this is for the standard size patient. This uh, dose should be reduced or increased based on patient size. The facility should utilize a standardized lung nodule identification classification reporting system. And currently, the only one that's available to us is LungRADS, which was developed by the American College of Radiology. The facility itself must make available smoking cessation interventions for current smokers. And then the facility must submit data to a CMS approved registry for each low dose CT lung cancer screening performed. And so even if the, you're screening perhaps a small number of Medicare patients, in order for your uh, facility to be reimbursed, they're asking that you uh, submit this data for everyone screened at your facility. Now this is an easy way to monitor the radiation dose. If you uh, have this uh, data uploaded to PACS, you, at the end of the CT screen you can see that uh, the CT dose index volume is reported. You want to keep that under 3 milligray. I also looked, like to look at the dose length product. So this is the dose in milligray 
times the length of the scan in centimeters, I like to make sure that this is under 100 to 105 because the typical length of the screen will be about 35 centimeters. So you want to uh, have a habit of monitoring that dose as you go along. Of course, this is also data that is uploaded to the uh, registry that was developed by ACR. So this is something that your facility will want to monitor as well. For those of you who are developing protocols for screening, I would recommend this website to you. This is the American Association of Physicists and Medicine website. If you go to the CT Protocols tab, there's a special uh, folder for lung cancer screening CT. I'm going to show you a, a typical page from this website. This is uh, happens to be for uh, GE scanners. You can find the scanner that you're planning to do the screens on, and they will give you a protocol that uh, you can incorporate into your scanner. And you can see at the bottom uh, line, you can see that the expected CT dose index uh, by volume that this protocol would deliver for an average size patient. So again, this is that website for those of you who are developing the screening protocols. And they have this for all of the manufacturers, not just GE. So if we look back at that, you can see that detector configuration, you can see at the far right in purple, where we've got a uh, 64 detector scanner with a 0.625 uh, thickness. Now, Sometimes people will ask if I have slices at 0.625, do I need to read them at that slice thickness? Because if I have a 35 centimeter long scan at 0.625 millimeters, that's a lot of images to look at. Here's how to uh, make that decision. Just keep in mind the slice thickness will affect your nodule detection rate. If we look at this uh, article in AGR in 2013 by Myrna Godoy, you can see that a 5 millimeter thick slice thickness, and look at the nodule detection rates for solid, part solid, and ground glass nodules, you can see that we have pretty poor detection rates for small nodules using a 5 millimeter th slice thickness. Whereas if we look at thinner slice thicknesses in that uh, one millimeter range, we have much higher nodule detection rates if we use thinner slice thicknesses. Personally, I like to use a 1 uh, to 1.25 millimeter slice thickness uh, to recognize nodules. I'm simply going to miss nodules if I'm using a, a thicker slices. Uh, this is another article. Uh, that looked at nodule detection rates even on one millimeter axial images and looking at the detection rate for five millimeter solid nodules you can see that we had a detection rate of only 49 percent there is some uh, individual variation with that but you can see that small nodules are difficult to see so this is one way you can improve your nodule detection rates, and that's to use uh, maximum intensity projections, or MIPS. This is an article in ADR in 2009 that compared uh, eight, 5 millimeter, 8 millimeter, and 11 millimeter slab thicknesses, looking at the abilities to recognize small pulmonary nodules. And you could see that about 69% of their nodules were smaller than 4 millimeters, so quite small. 21% were in the 4 to 8 millimeter range, which is more of our interest level. 9% were larger than 8 millimeters. And you can see that they had a their highest nodule detection rate with 8 millimeter thick uh, MIPS. And you can see they had a much higher nodule detection rate uh, compared with the, the 5 or the 11 millimeter MIPS. This is an example of, of one millimeter slice thickness on your left, and then on your right, there's a five millimeter axial MIP. You could see that the advantage of, of MIPS is that it keeps uh, blood vessels within the imaging plane. Something that might be misinterpreted as a blood vessel is just a little bit more readily recognized uh, on, a, on a MIP. So I like to look first at the, the thin, the one millimeter slice thicknesses, and then I will look at MIPS in both uh, axial 
uh, sagittal and coronal uh, formats. You can see here on the left we have a couple of nodules up against the major fissure that might be difficult to appreciate on axial images. We can see their perifissural location here and we can get a better idea of their size compared with if we were looking at them on axial images. So I highly recommend that you you incorporate MIPS and these different uh, formats, sagittal and coronal formats, just to keep you from missing small pulmonary nodules. Now, we need to report the results of the screening CT, and those of you who are familiar with BIRADS from mammography will find uh, lung RADS somewhat uh, familiar. Uh, and this was developed again by the American College of Radiology to help us standardize the reporting of the screening CT. It standardized not only the, re the results in terms of the nodules, it, it gives us management guidelines so we know what to recommend for the next step and we can all do this in a consistent fashion. So this is a busy screen. I'm going to chop it up for you in a minute. This is Lung Rads version 1 and you can see that the categories in the far left ranging from an incomplete screen all the way down to suspicious screen. We have the category descriptor the category in terms of number and you'll want to be familiar with these different category numbers the findings, the management. You can see that the probability of malignancy ranges from less than 1% for uh, scans that are read as, uh, as benign up to a 15 or higher percent likelihood of malignancy in this higher category of suspicious or category 4. And let's uh, look at these one at a time. So let's start with just incomplete screens, negative screens, and screens that we're going to consider benign. So these are category 0, category 1, and category 2. Then I'll look again at the next uh, sequence of 3, 4A, 4B, and 4X. And then at the very bottom of this, you can see that there's uh, another category, category S for significant findings, category C for patients who have had a prior lung cancer. These are just modifiers you can add to your screen. Let's start with an incomplete screen. This is a, uh, a patient who may have come to you for a screen, but they tell you they have a prior chest CT. You don't want to render a report necessarily until you get that prior chest CT, so you can report this as an incomplete category zero until you get that prior exam for comparison. You can also use the incomplete category if the patient has been screened, perhaps you've missed the lung apex, you missed the lung basis, you want to bring that back, patient back for additional imaging. This is a, a category zero, will uh, give you a way to record that patient and yet uh, modify it later. So obviously the management for this is we're either going to get the prior screen or we're going to bring the patient back for additional imaging. Our next category is category 1. This is a negative screen. This patient either has no nodules or nodules that are definitively benign. And we can decide that they're benign because they have a benign pattern of calcification. On the image on the right you can see that it's completely calcified, so it might be completely calcified. It might have central calcification, popcorn calcification, or concentric or a lamellar pattern of calcification. In addition, there may be nodules that contain fat. You think this is a hamartoma, so we can call this a category one. This patient is going to uh, want to continue with annual screening with low dose CT in 12 months. So this is a negative screen, either no nodules or the nodules are definitively benign. Now let's move on to category two. Category 2 is a, a patient who has nodules with a very low likelihood of becoming a clinically active cancer. So we're going to say that these nodules have a benign appearance or behavior. And we have three different uh, categories now based on the nodule consistency of either solid nodules, part solid, or non-solid nodules. Many of you will be familiar with the term ground glass nodule, which is interchangeable with the term non-solid nodule. So let's look first at uh, uh, solid nodules. So this is, again, a nodule with a very low likelihood of becoming a clinically active cancer, either because it's small or we have uh, 
serial screens that show an absence of growth. So uh, the solid nodule less than six millimeters in diameter would be considered a category two. If you have a previous screen which did not show a nodule and now you have a new solid nodule, even though that nodule is three millimeters, uh, this would be considered a category two now. So just keep in mind that you're going to use different parts of the lung rads guidelines for patients who have a baseline screen as compared with patients who are returning for a repeat screen. For both of these patients, uh, we're going to recommend continued annual screening with low dose CT in 12 months. Now let's say that the nodule is part solid. There's a ground glass component, but there's also a solid component. If the nodule measures less than six millimeters in total diameter on both lines, baseline screening, so we're adding both the solid and the ground glass component, if that's less than six millimeters, we're going to see it consider this a category two. So again, a very low likelihood of becoming a clinically active cancer. Again, return for screening in 12 months. And then the last one in this category two is a non-solid or ground glass nodule. We're going to use a, a size threshold of 20 millimeters. So if it's smaller than 20 millimeters at baseline, we're going to call it a category two. If we have a previous uh, scan and we see that it's larger than 20, let's say we have a 30 millimeter ground glass nodule, a pure ground glass nodule that did not change in size or was changed very little in size in comparison with the previous screen, then we're going to call that a category two. And again, continue annual screen with low dose CT in 12 months. So here's an example in the top left. You can see that there's a solid nodule, but it's smaller than six millimeters. We did not see calcification within it, so we couldn't call it a category one. And yet it's less than six millimeters in size. We're going to call this a category two probably benign on the basis of size. On the right, we can see a non-solid or pure ground glass nodule. It's under 20 millimeters in size, and we're going to call this a category two. Bring the patient back for annual seat repeat screen in 12 months. Even though the patient is uh, recorded as a category two, I like to include the fact that there was a nodule, which perhaps will encourage the patient to come back for the, their repeat screen in, an, in 12 months. Let's look at the bottom part of the lung rads uh, guidelines. And this is where we've increased our concern. We have uh, nodules that are probably benign and nodules that are suspicious. So let's look at categories three and categories four. Again, we have to consider each category will have solid nodules, part solid nodules, and non-solid nodules to consider. So let's talk with category three, uh, probably benign. This is perhaps also described as sort of an indeterminate nodule. We're not ready to just wait and follow it up in 12 months. We're not necessarily ready to biopsy. We, we, it's an indeterminate nodule that we're going to do a follow-up CT in six months. So this would include a solid nodule that is at least six millimeters in size, but less than eight millimeters on the initial baseline screen. Or if the patient had a previous negative screen and now returns with a new nodule that is four millimeters, but less than six, we're going to call this a category three. We're going to recommend that they come back in six months for a repeat low dose CT. And it's important to make sure that the follow-up screens are low dose so that we can make sure that we deliver these uh, patients the lowest possible dose uh, over the cumulative period of screening. If we move on to the next category of part solid nodules, this would include nodules that are larger than six millimeters total diameter with a solid component that is less than six or if the previous scan was negative, now they have a new part solid nodule that is less than six millimeters in total diameter. Again, we're going to bring them back in six months for a low dose CT so we can see if there's been any change in the size or appearance of this nodule. And then if we consider the non-solid or ground glass nodule, if it's larger than 20 millimeters in baseline at the baseline CT, or if it's new on a repeat screen, 
we're going to consider this a category three. Again, bring them back in six months for our repeat low dose CT. So here's some examples. On the left, we could see a solid nodule that was at least six millimeters in diameter. We can see uh, also this would include part solid nodules that are larger than six millimeters in total diameter with a solid component that is less than six. And it would also include non-solid nodules larger than 20 millimeters. There is some inter-reader variability in recognizing what's a part solid nodule and what's a non-solid nodule. If you look at the case on the bottom right, I think if you showed this to 10 radiologists, you might have five that would call this a non-solid and five that would call this a part solid nodule. And that makes a significant difference in how we categorize, how we follow. So you want to try to uh, carefully look uh, at these nodules for a solid component so that we categorize them correctly. Repeat annual screens. Uh, Again, the guidelines are different for repeat annual screens in comparison with baseline screens, and particularly the size threshold changes. If it's a new solid nodule, uh, we are now using a size threshold of four, whereas for the baseline, we used a size threshold of six. If it's a new part solid nodule, less than six millimeters in total diameter, uh, we're going to call this a category three. And if we have a non-solid nodule, uh, that is larger than 20 millimeters, uh, either on baseline or new, uh, we're going to call this a category three. So here's our different size thresholds uh, that we're going to use for repeat annual screens. Now let's look at the suspicious category, and these are the ones that are very critical because they're going to require additional testing or tissue sampling. So let's look at the different uh, types of category four. If we look at the bottom of this chart, you can see, again, we're going to look at solid nodules, part solid nodules. We have an endobronchial nodule now appearing for 4A. Note that non-solid nodules are not in the four category. A nodule cannot be considered four unless it has a solid component. So if it is a pure ground glass nodule, it's going to remain a category three. And that's one of the reasons why I say it's very important to look for that solid component, because only if there's a solid component will we move that into a category four. So let's look at this. So suspicious category four. So let's look first at 4A. This would include solid nodules that are eight millimeters, but less than 15 at baseline, or it's growing and less than eight, or it's new from six to eight. We're going to call this a category 4A. You're going to use your clinical judgment at this point. You could repeat the low dose CT in three months, or if there's a solid component that is uh, larger than eight millimeters, you might recommend a PET CT. So you've got some uh, reason ability to use your clinical judgment to decide, do you want to recommend repeat CT? Do you want to have that three month delay? Or do you want to immediately go to a PET CT? If we look at part solid nodules, uh, that we're going to consider them category 4A suspicious if they're larger than six millimeters with a solid component that's six to eight millimeters, or they're new or growing and the solid component is less than four. Again, you're going to uh, have the ability to choose between a three-month follow-up low-dose CT. If the solid component uh, is uh, up to eight, you, you can go to a PET CT. So uh, you could see that we're going to use PET CT quite conservatively in, in these part solid nodules. And then an endobronchial nodule would be considered a category 4A suspicious. Again, we can use follow-up or PET-CT. And if we look at uh, some examples of this on your left, you can see a solid nodule that uh, very suspicious. There's speculation. Uh, and we can see that solid nodules, at least eight, but less than 15 millimeters, category 4A, part solid nodules, 
uh, at least six millimeters with a solid component of uh, six to eight and then endobronchial nodules for these category 4a. Now when they come for follow-up we're looking not just at nodule size we're looking at nodule growth. If we look at the nodule on at baseline you can see that it was small and might have been considered uh, uh, a benign or probably benign nodule. But when we followed it up a year later, you could see that the nodule is growing. It's growing, but it's smaller than 8 millimeters. We're going to consider this a suspicious category 4A. If the nodule is new, our, again, our guidelines are 6 to 8 part solid nodules, at least 6 millimeters uh, in diameter, total diameter with a newer growing solid component less than 4. 4B just takes that level of suspicion up one notch. This is a larger solid nodule, at least 15 millimeters, or a newer growing solid nodule, uh, at least 8 millimeters. At this point, you could decide to go on and do a diagnostic uh, chest CT, uh, PET CT, or you could even go on to tissue sampling, biopsy, even surgical resection, depending on the patient's uh, comorbidities and on your suspicion for malignancy. For part solid nodules uh, with a solid component at least 8 millimeters in, in diameter or with a newer growing solid component that's at least 4 millimeters in diameter, we're going to categorize this as 4B. Again, we have several uh, management options. Uh, again, the same management options here. And then if let's look at some examples. On the left, you can see that is, here's a solid uh, spiculated nodule in the periphery of the left lower lobe that is larger than 15 millimeters in diameter. And then on the middle and right-hand screen, you can see part solid nodules with a solid component of at least 8 millimeters. So again, you have several decisions here. You could do a diagnostic chest CT. You could do a PET CT. You could recommend tissue sampling for each of these category 4B uh, lesions. Here's another uh, uh, lesion that I'm going to show you how it changed over time. At baseline, you might have considered this to be a pure ground glass or non-solid nodule. Even one year later, it looks somewhat similar. But at the two-year follow-up, you can see it's developing more of a solid component. So on follow-up screens, it's very important to look at the change over time. Some of these part solid nodules, the diameter may not change, but the development of a solid component increases suspicion for malignancy. There's another category in the suspicious category, and that's category 4X. This is included uh, for cases in which you find additional uh, uh, factors that increase your suspicion for malignancy. In this case, you can see the large right lower paratracheal lymph node that would increase your suspicion for lung cancer. The, the nodule itself might be a category 4A, but the presence of the lymph node might make you put this up into a category 4X. Again, same uh, management guidelines for this category 4X. There's two other uh, categories that we'll talk about. Category S, this is sort of beyond the scope of this talk, but there may also be clinically significant or potentially clinically significant findings not related to lung cancer. For example, coronary artery calcification, COPD, these may be c considered clinically significant, and you can add them on to your screening report using a uh, modifier S and then management is as appropriate to that finding. Similarly, if the patient has a previous history of lung cancer, you can uh, add that category to your overall category of, of 0 to 4. So in summary, annual screening for lung cancer with low-dose CT can reduce the mortality from lung cancer by 20% in a high-risk population. and we really feel that we can change the dismal statistics of lung cancer if we can expand uh, screening uh, to uh, smokers and current smokers. The eligibility criteria, the patient must be between the ages of 55 and 77 in order to be reimbursed by a third-party payer such as private insurance or CMS. They must be a current or former smoker who has quit within the last 15 years with it at least a 30-pack year smoking history. 
And if you can adhere to LungRADS, you'll find that this standardizes the approach to indeterminate nodules and makes it easier to communicate with healthcare providers about the results. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you have found this useful.